what's going on now? Before we go to the 12th chapter of Ezekiel, turn with me, please, if you will, to the third chapter of Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 3. We'll begin in verse 5. For you are not being sent to a people of unintelligible speech or difficult language, but to the house of Israel, nor to many peoples of unintelligible speech or difficult language whose words you can't understand. But I've sent you to them who should listen to you. Yet the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, since they are not willing to listen to me. Surely the whole house of Israel is stubborn and obstinate. That is backslidden. We did a teaching a number of years ago called Ezekiel's Scroll, where we look at this in depth. The people who claim to believe what you believe, who claim to know what you know, who can understand what you're saying, are going to reject the truth when you tell it to them. I speak not primarily of Israel and the Jews. That has been the state of fallen Israel since their rejection of the Messiah. I speak of something else. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation. Chapter 3, the message to Sardis. Sardis comes from the Greek of the flesh, Sardis. To the angel of the church of Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, you have a name, that you're alive, but you are dead. Notice, of course, they think they're alive, but they're dead. I point you to our book, The Dilemma of Laodicea, where we do a exposition of the seven churches. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain. A number of years ago, we did a conference similar to this one called Strengthen the Things That Remain. This is the sequel. Okay, but what do we do now? A lot has changed in the last couple of years. Strengthen the things that remain. Okay, but what do we do now? Where do you go from here? Wake up and strengthen the things that remain. Again, most of the church is asleep to the reality. Laodicea is lukewarm. Sardis is asleep. The things which are about to die... I've not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Again, in the book on um, the seven churches, the Dilemma of Laodicea, we explain how this corresponds typologically to Protestantism. The gospel was about to die when the Reformation took place. It happened, but the Reformation did not go far enough. Uh, I don't want to divert into that issue. You can get the book, The Dilemma of Laodicea, or we have other teaching on our website dealing with it. I've not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Remember from where you have fallen and what you have received and heard. 
They received it. They heard it. People used to believe this stuff. Mainstream Protestantism went into theological liberalism beginning in the 19th century. From 19th century German rationalism, the philosophy became the theology. Liberal theology, liberal Protestantism, further from the truth than the Church of Rome ever was, and the Church of Rome was very far from the truth, and is. But we're addressing mainstream evangelical Protestantism. We're talking about denominations that once believed the truth. You know this. Where do we go from here? Look with me, please, if you will. Once again, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 12. Verse 16. I shall spare a few of them from sword, famine, and pestilence. These are interesting terms. In Hebrew, a sword can be a metaphor for war, but the word for sword in Hebrew is head of. Logisa, loisa, goy, la goy, head of. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Okay? Neither shall they learn war anymore. Okay? Then famine. The Hebrew word for famine is quite simple. It's the same word for hunger, basically. And I better be careful. Although my wife is a math teacher, she also fortunately slash unfortunately has a degree in Hebrew. And if I ever make a mistake... <laughs> I'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> I always tell people, some people marry great cooks, I married a great concordance. <laughs> okay. And then, we have pestilence. Peter. Okay. Ah, oh, there's a hay. The Greek is spelled, well, I'll write it in Greek. It's pronounced pine. But the word in Greek is this. Penoi, but it's basically pine, okay? Is the way a proper Greek would pronounce it, okay? Then you've got famine, which is hunger, hunger in, in, in Greek. But then you've got the word for pestilence, loimos, loimos, loimos. Lo 
Well, I'll just write it this way. Okay. Pine, sword, famine, pestilence. That's how it is. Okay. Now, three things. The sword, metaphor for war, famine, and pestilence. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Revelation chapter 6. And I saw in verse 1, when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice of thunder, Come. Now thunder represents the voice of God in biblical imagery. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Okay. Now, very briefly, we know Antichrist will counterfeit Christ. My apologies, of course, to those who know this. Look with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 19. Verse 11, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, the white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. Jesus comes, as it were, in a white horse. Antichrist will counterfeit Jesus. Antichrist always tries to counterfeit Christ. But he comes first. The Antichrist comes, chapter, chapter 6, comes before chapter 19. You've got the first one in Revelation 6. The second one. He broke the second seal, and I heard the second creature saying, Come! And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it was granted to take peace from the earth, that men should slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. Verse 5, when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius. Three quarts of barley for a denarius do not harm the oil and wine. Breaking it down into modern wage scales, take a day's wages on average to feed one person. At the famine, the ra'ev. At the pine, then you got the ra'ev. The pine is the sword. And then the famine, the ra'ev, okay, or the head of in Hebrew, and then the ra'ev, and now you have the third. Verse 7, and when he broke the fourth seal, I heard a voice come forth from heaven. And I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name of death and Hades following with him, and authority was given to him over a quarter of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with 
pestilence, Noemos. Notice it is a constellation of the three things. The war, the famine, and the pestilence. Wars have happened before. Famines have happened before in conjunction with war. The ancient Assyrians made war by siege. They would cut off the food supply. Okay. But then pestilence? Well, wars have always resulted in things like malaria, okay, and post-operative infection, gangrene, but pestilence, obviously, biological warfare is only about a hundred years old. The combination of these things, war, famine, and pestilence. Now just look at a newspaper today or yesterday or online news. There are two major breadbaskets of the planet for production of grain. One is the North American Great Plains and the states and Canada. The Texas Panhandle up through, you know, Kansas and Nebraska and into the eastern Dakotas and then up into the central provinces of Canada. That is one of the world's grain baskets. Okay. Asia does not have a grain basket. It has a rice basket in the Mekong Delta. It does not have a grain basket. The other grain basket are the steppes. S-T-E-P-P-E-S. I know many of you will be familiar with it in Ukraine and on the Russian-Ukrainian border. That is the second grain basket of the world. A bad harvest in either one of those places, you've got a problem. The Americans are growing grain to create ethanol to keep the price of petrol cheaper putting the alcohol into the gasoline. You've got these storage silos in the Ukraine with the harvest, unable to export from Odessa, the port, being bombarded as we speak. Putin's trying to get control of as much of the Black Sea coast of the Ukraine as he can, and the havoc being wrecked by the war will make it impossible to replant for next year's harvest. A one-year loss of harvest being done deliberately is an act of war. If you want a historical example, Shaka Zulu did this in southern Africa. He wouldn't let the people plant for a season and he starved most of the population of his own of the Zulus because he wanted everybody to mourn the death of his mother so he wanted everybody else to be <laughs> plagued with mourning and things at the same time. <laughs> people have done this before. People have done terrible things like this. Stalin did it three times. Worse than 1927. To meet grain exports to get foreign exchange, foreign money, he let the Ukrainians starve on a massive scale. This has happened before, and it's happened in the steps before. Most of the grain exported into the Middle East and Africa comes from the steps. You lose that crop, you lose that harvest. Okay, the price of bread is already going up in Britain, isn't it?
But do you know what's going to happen to the price of bread in the Middle East and in Africa? And when people starve, they want to migrate to get food. What's going to happen? Nation rising against ki nation, kingdom against kingdom. Do you see how the geopolitical economics are in harmony with what the scripture says? A combination of war and pestilence working together. I'm sorry, war and famine working together. They always have. I mean, to some degree, people did it. Mengitsu starved his own, Mengitsu took the grain coming from Europe and America into Djibouti in the Horn of Africa, and he cut off the supply to starve his own people into submission in, in Ethiopia. Uh, the, the, the people have done this. Stalin did this. Other people have done this. But it's happening now. It's happening now. Only, I'm not talking about Africa. <laughs> it's happening in Europe. And it's not happening under Stalin. It's happening under Putin. So you've got this combination of sword and looming famine. Then you have the pestilence. I was just talking to my friend, Dr. Vijay. He's a consultant endocrinologist who's with us, dear brother in the Lord. Where are you, BJ, doctor? Is he here? He's hiding from me? Where, where is he? Is he? <laughs> BJ, you here? Doctor? Anyway, he's here. <laughs> he, 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 he's, he's hiding from me. I'll tell you why later. He can tell you better than I can as a specialist physician what is really going on with you know what. If it was about a disease, if it was about a virus, But when it becomes about warfare, population control, oh boy. These things are happening. And they're happening in the Western world. And the things that people said would not happen again after World War I happened only worse in World War II, didn't they? The war to end all wars simply set the stage for the next one. Then they said, we're going to have NATO. And America and Britain were going to team up and protect the continent from Russia. And there'll be a Cold War based on mutually assured destruction. You'd have to be mad to push the button. Now Putin is talking about pushing the button. <laughs> and he's not the only one. I've said this before. When I was a kid in New York, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and Nikita Khrushchev came to New York to the UN, and he took off his shoe and began pounding on the podium in the United Nations, saying, we will bury you. He went back to Russia, and the Politburo deposed him in no time, he was gone. We cannot have a crazy man with his finger on the button. When Nixon called the stage three nuclear alert during the Yom Kippur War, General Haig and Henry Kissinger were trying to control him. He was stoned on alcohol and drugs and tranquilizers during the Watergate crisis. And they said, we can't have a crazy person with his finger on the button. Even the Republican Party establishment of his own party said, we've got to get rid of this guy. He was gone. Because it would be mad to have your finger on that button contemplating pushing it. What happens when you have India 
and the BJP in power in India. And they believe if you push the button, you'll be reincarnated as a Brahmin. What's the problem? It's a blessing. Well, what happens when you have a nuclear-armed Pakistan that persecutes more Christians than any other nation in Asia? And they believe the only assurance of salvation is to be shahadi, to die in a jihad. Push the button, what's the problem? I want my 70 virgins, bang. These people are really this crazy. And the reason they are this crazy is because they are demonically deceived. Rational powers were able to pull the world back from the brink of nuclear holocaust. Remember what it says in Peter's epistle. The stoichia, the elements, will be dissolved with fire. Something before Einstein nobody knew was possible. But that's not our subject tonight. It just relates to it. So we have these three things, the sword, the famine, and the pestilence in concert with each other, happening simultaneously, and the world's concerned with it. And the world is in a state that has never been as perilous since the Cuban Missile Crisis, if you're old enough to remember that. Only then, the Russians got rid of Khrushchev. What a situation. Europe is finding out that the Americans are fed up. Britain is no longer in Europe. And I can tell you why most Americans would fight to defend Britain. And because of the Christians, most Americans would stand up for Israel. Americans are tired of giving continental Europeans a free ride. Spending more money on European defense than Europeans do. Wealthy countries like Germany and France and stuff, and they won't even put up 2% of their GDP for defense. The Americans saw the cold, Thatcher and, and the Americans saw the Iron Curtain come down. They saw the Berlin Wall dismantled. Like 400 million people were set free from Sovietism, if you count the Warsaw Pact. That was it. Who picked up the tab? The Yanks. The Yanks and the Brits. Mainly the Yanks, obviously but it was the Anglo-American power structure that won the Cold War. They did it. It wasn't the Europeans. It wasn't the Europeans. And the Europeans resented this. Britain still had power and influence in the world because they were cousins of the Americans and because they had a commonwealth. They still had influence in Australia and Canada and things like this. But France was a has-been power. <laughs> they resented this. The, the Yanks would talk to the Brits, but they weren't going to talk to the Europeans. This was resentment. The Gaul was driven by resentment. He pulled his troops out of, out of NATO and hit them back at the Americans and Brits. Americans got fed up with this. Under Trump, we're not going to continue to pay for this. You pick up your own share of the tab. But Trump was a stronger president. And I'm not trying to divert into a political polemic. I'm just trying to look at what's happening in light of prophecy. North Korea stopped testing missiles under Trump. Because he said what he would do to them. China was not threatening to invade Taiwan under Trump. Okay. Putin would not do what he's doing now under Trump. <laughs> and because Trump blessed Israel, God blessed America. The economy did well. Petrol was cheap. Food was cheap. Inflation was low. Yes, there were problems. Record black American employment. 
the employment situation of black Americans had never been so good as it was under Trump. Never. More blacks had jobs. This had never happened before. The, 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 the other party had them on welfare and food stamps to keep them politically dependent. So they, they, I was a strong person, but now you got a weak one? Gives up Afghanistan? What does Putin think? This guy's not going to do anything. He was the vice president of, of Obama. Obama drew a, a line in the ground and said, don't use bacteriological we biological weapons in Syria. Warn Russia. And then when they did, he did nothing. Biden was his vice president. Putin has no reason to fear Biden. None. So what happens? Now Europe is getting nervous, isn't it? You see countries that were always neutral, Sweden and Finland wanting to get into NATO. Even Switzerland sending aid to the Ukraine. These things have never happened. You can't rely on the Yanks anymore. The Brits no longer have a vested interest in the continent. They're trying to make the iron stick to the clay. Just like Daniel said, everything's changing. You understand it. It can't be the same as it was. The world cannot be what it was before September 11th. The world cannot be what it was before 2008. The, the economic crash, subprime crash. And the world cannot be what it was after the surrender to radical Islam in a war that <laughs> was basically won. <laughs> All well, they needed was 2,500 Americans to stay there, and the Taliban couldn't have taken the country over. Instead, Biden leaves and gives them $8 billion, $8 billion in military aid. Tanks, helicopters, everything. To the, to, to, to the Taliban, to the Al-Qaeda's sponsors. <laughs> what does Putin have to be afraid of? Nobody. Nobody. Maybe if the Yanks and Brits were still involved, you'd have to count the cost, but now you can know, They may have bitten off more than he can chew, but it shows you. Sword. Famine. Pestilence. Those three things. What is missing? One horseman is missing. You got the ashen one? You've got the red one, you've got the black one. They're all mounted. There's only one missing. Don't worry, he's coming. And I don't mean Jesus. He's coming too. Now let's understand about Ezekiel. Jeremiah warned. But they persecuted and rejected Jeremiah. Before Jeremiah, Isaiah warned. King Manasseh sought him in half. They rejected, persecuted Isaiah, and they wanted to kill them. Before that, the ten northern tribes were warned by Hosea and by Amos. Rejected them too. But now by Ezekiel's time, the second invasion predicted by Joel from Babylon was happening. Now they knew 
what Isaiah warned of and what Joel warned of and what Jeremiah warned of, they knew. Those men were right. What they said was going to happen has happened. It was undeniable. They were vindicated by history. Nobody could deny that they were right. The ones you rejected and cursed and martyred and persecuted, they were right. Nobody could deny it. So they ignored it. Just ignored it. I had an Irish Catholic mother. I warned her for many years, among other things, that the Roman Catholic Church was permeated with pedophilia. Uh, pedophilia. I warned her for decades. But my mother's Irish identity was bound up with her Catholic identity, unfortunately. And she couldn't deny it. I kept showing the news clips and the priest getting caught and all this and them. She couldn't deny it. So she did what unsaved people do. She ignored it. You just ignore it. If it's something you can't accept, even though you know it's true, because of your other interests, you ignore it. As if ignoring it was going to make it go away or change the reality. No. Just think of a toothache. You get a toothache, the most logical common sense thing to do is to go get the tooth x-rayed and get it filled. Otherwise, you wind up, what I'm doing, getting an implant. <laughs> Alfred E. Newman. So, I'll, I'll just rub some Ambisol on it, take an aspirin and just... Some people, I'm too busy to go to the dentist. Some people have a phobia of dentists. Some people, I don't know, whatever. They just don't do, the sign is there, but they don't do anything. So something that would be easily filled now requires an expensive root canal. And if you don't do that, it's going to cost three, four thousand pounds for an implant. So most people will just have it extracted and get denture. Who wants dentures? <laughs> you wind up worse off than if you dealt with the problem to begin with. Well, the state of world affairs is like a toothache. But I'm talking not about the world. The world will always have a toothache. I'm talking about the church. The church. Let's look. Nobody could deny that everything these other prophets before Ezekiel was saying happened. But it didn't fit their agenda. So what does God tell Ezekiel? Remember, the Babylonian captivity, the Babylonian captivity of the Old Testament is borrowed, recycled in the New Testament as Babylon the Great. If you want to understand Babylon the Great, you have to go back to understanding the Babylonian Empire. In fact, the whole Babylon motif goes back to the Tower of Babel. We once did a conference on Babel and Babel Rising. Still available on our website. And God tells Ezekiel in chapter 12 what he told him in chapter 3. They're a rebellious people. Son of man, he typifies Christ. You live in the midst of a rebellious house. They have eyes to see, but they don't. Ears to hear, but they don't hear. For they're rebellious. 
They're not blind. They are willfully blind. They are not deaf. They are willfully deaf. This is John 9 stuff. Jesus said, I came that those who see are going to become blind. And <laughs> they're not blind. They're willfully blind. Willfully deaf. And of course, in modern terms, the absurdity of motivational psychology gets into the church and they pseudo-Christianize it. That's negative. I don't receive it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> this is the kind of... You, you've all encountered that kind of idiocy, haven't you? And that's it's, it's religious idiocy. It's just religious... There's no, there's no euphemism for it. It's religious idiocy. It is self-destructive religious idiocy. So he says, son of man, prepare for yourself baggage for exile and go into exile by day in their sight. Even go into exile from your place to another place in their sight. Perhaps they'll understand, though they're a rebellious house. Bring your baggage out by day in the sight of baggage for exile. Then you'll go at evening in their sight. As those who go to exile, you're sneaking out. Dig a hole through the wall in their sight and go through it. In other words, escape surreptitiously. But let them see you do it. <laughs> As if you're escaping surreptitiously, but let them conspicuously observe it. Or let them observe what you're doing as something conspicuous. Load the baggage on your shoulder in their sight. Carry it out in the dark. You shall cover your face so they cannot see the land. For I've set you as a sign to the house of Israel. And I did as I had been commanded. By day I brought out my baggage like the baggage of an exile. Then in the evening I dug through the wall with my hands. I went out in the dark and carried the baggage on my shoulder. And in the morning the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said, What are you doing? Say to them, Thus says the Lord, this burden concerns the prince of Jerusalem, as well as all the house of Israel who are in it. I am assigned to you. I have done so, it will be done to them. They'll go into exile and into captivity. Now, notice something. In order to be a prophetic warning to others, you must, to a degree, endure the judgment that's coming against them. You have to earn the right to be that kind of a voice by paying a price that shows you mean it. God told Jeremiah, I'll give your life as a ransom. Well, you might make it. But when God calls you to warn others, you're going to be rejected. Persecuted. You know, I have no problem. Uh, problem. I've been attacked by Muslim gangs in Speaker's Corner in, in London when I was younger. I, and I, terrible lies about me in the, in the Jewish Telegraph and but rabbis and, and that's par for the course. It goes with the turf. You know, what do you expect? <laughs> but the lies that I've suffered from so-called Christians, the unbelievable lies. And the, 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 the lengths they would go with the vulgarity and the four-letter words and stuff. You couldn't believe it. But they did it. Oh, the prince, in verse 12, was among you will load his baggage on his shoulder in the dark and go out. They'll dig a hole through the wall to bring it out. He'll cover his face so he cannot see the land. And I shall spread my net over him. He'll be caught in my snare, and I'll bring him to Babylon in the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he will not see it, though he will die. Now what happened to Zedekiah? Remember? They tore his eyes out and dragged him to Babylon in chains. He went there, but he couldn't see it. 
You want to be blind? <laughs> Don't worry. You'll be blind, all right. You'll be blind, all right. God won't do it. He'll let your enemies do it. He doesn't have to do it. You'll do it to yourself. But let's look. He goes on and he says, I'm going to spare a few of them from sword, famine, and pestilence. Verse 17, Moreover, the word of the Lord came, Son of man, eat your bread with trembling, drink your water with quivering and anxiety. Then he said to the people of the land, Thus says the Lord concerning the inhabitants of Jerusalem, They'll eat their bread with anxiety and drink their water with horror because their land will be stripped of its fullness on account of the violence of those who live in it. And boy, when <laughs> the food prices are going up here, does, do you know what's going to happen in the third world? And the inhabitants of those cities will be laid waste. The land will be a desolation. Want to be blind? You don't want to hear? You'll be laid waste. You're going to be a desolation. Yeah. Willow Creek Church. Yeah. Brownsville, Pensacola. Yeah. Hillsong. Yeah. They become a desolation, don't they? They become a desolation. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to see it become a desolation. But you already know that. And I'm only naming a few. But let's continue. Look at these churches. Just look at Britain. What happened as a result of the COVID, of the famine? They couldn't meet. No people, no collections. No collections. How do you pay the mortgage? They're in trouble financially, aren't they? Declining numbers are being depopulated and they're going broke. Because they chose to believe a lie. By the unmerited grace of Jesus Christ. Faithful ministries, and I say it humbly and cautiously, Morio being one of them, are prospering. We've opened the new orphanage in India. Finally, they wouldn't let us, we had built it, but we couldn't open it because of COVID. Now they've given us the permit. We have Morio Europe now in Holland. Expanded the work in the Philippines, as most of you know. We did all kinds of stuff. And, more coming, Lord willing. Um, again, I, the, there was a the, the, the Christian school, a Messianic school in Israel was in big trouble financially because of COVID. Parents couldn't send their kids there, they didn't have the money for the fees for the teachers and things like this. They were, this is a school for believers, children of believers in Israel, Jew and Arab. And they, they were in trouble. And they needed very large amounts of money very large amounts of money. I don't say this to praise Moriel. I say it to praise Jesus who blessed Moriel. We bailed them out by God's grace. <laughs> that school is going and it's teaching the children of Jewish and Arab believers in the way of the Lord. From little kids to the age of high school, to the end of high school, Doing it. How come the Lord blessed them? Because they taught the truth. Yes. How come the Lord blessed us in order to bless them? The truth. I'm sorry, we need to turn the cell phones off. We're recording, please. Thank you. There's going to be a lot more of that. I knew right from 2008 that there were going to be those who the Lord 
shook. And there were going to be those who the Lord blessed. See, if you're built on the truth, you can't be shaken. <laughs> if you're built on the truth, you can't be shaken. Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. I am the way, the truth. The truth can't be shaken. But everything else will be. But okay, this is what's happening. And we know what's happening, and it's undeniable. And it is happening to the economy of Europe. And it is having tremendous impact on global inflation. China is in trouble. China is in worse trouble than most people realize. China is in worse trouble than the West, economically. No, everything that can be shaken means everything, including the nominations, ministries, churches. Well, let's see what else is going to happen. Look with me to the next chapter, chapter 13. What does the Lord say? Verse 6, their so-called prophecy, falsehood, lying divination. They're prophets of lying spirits. Who says, the Lord declares. But the Lord did not send them, yet they hope for the fulfillment of their word. They hope. <laughs> Real hope is a future fact. Did you not see a false vision and speak a lying divination? Oh, boy. Well, what do these people then do? Going back to chapter 24. Chapter 12, verse 24. There will no longer be any false vision or flattering divination. For thus says the Lord, whatever word I speak will be performed. It will no longer be delayed, for in your days, O rebellious house, I will speak it and perform it. Furthermore, son of man, behold the house of Israel, saying, the vision he sees is for many years from now, and he prophesies of times far off. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord, none of my words will be delayed any longer. This is very serious. We have reached a point where his words are not going to delay any longer. We did a teaching called the Vector where we speak about how the closer you get to the Omega point, the faster you approach it. The closer you get to the return of Jesus, the faster prophetic events happen. I refer you to the teaching of the victim. Notice there's people who are beginning to have to change their tune. I have been listening and I've been sent clips recently by other believers who believe what I do or similar things to what I do or what most of the Moriel people or what, 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 what the Moriel people believe about the returning of Christ, that Christ will not come until we know who the Antichrist is. And I'm seeing. First of all, they admit they're hemorrhaging. The pre-trib people are losing devotees. People are seeing what's happening and they're realizing they trusted in something that is not true. The Holy Spirit is showing them. Now look, 
50 years ago, 100 years ago, so what? It didn't make much difference. It might have been an error, but it wasn't going to affect anything practically too much. But now, it will affect things practically. People trying to take a false sense of security in being raptured out of here before these bad things happen. I've been saying for years, come with me to Vietnam. I will show you what it's really like. They'd love to be raptured out of here. Oh boy. The pre-trib people are beginning to crack, some of them. But I've even listened to some of their major leaders now beginning to soften their tone. Yeah. Well, we may be persecuted. Well, we may see some tribulation. The problem is they've built their empires on a myth. <laughs> they've built their, em their ministries have been built on this myth. Yes, we can pick up a newspaper. And When you go to the newspaper or to the media, you will see there's the sword, the famine, and indeed the pestilence. But that is not the sword, the famine, and the pestilence I'm most concerned with. Let's see the ones I'm most concerned with. Look with me to Amos chapter 8, please. A familiar verse to most of you. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for the hearing of the words of the Lord. Oh, there is a famine on the world for bread and water. But that is simply reflective and emblematic of another famine. A famine for the hearing of the word of God. It is amazing how few Christians even know basic doctrine. It is amazing how few people professing regeneration, second birth, can explain the gospel accurately. It's amazing. There is a famine for the hearing of the word of God. <laughs> but then there's a pestilence coming. Well, look with me, please, to Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, those who suppress the laity. <coughs> However, we read something else. When Jesus comes back, in Revelation, he has a sword, doesn't he? And what does it say he also has? It says pestilence. <laughs> he is going to bring a judgment 
of pestilence. Now let's look at the church of Thyatira, chapter 2. Behold, in verse 22, I'll cast her upon a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence. Now look at this. It is not just her. It is those who commit adultery with her. We have any former Roman Catholics here? Please put your hand up. If I'm saying anything false, anything not true, I would like a former Roman Catholic to stand up publicly and call me out on it on the live stream. We are told in Galatians that if an angel of God comes with another gospel, they're accursed. The gospel is the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. As you've heard me say, the gospel of Rome is you atone for your own in purgatory. In order to believe in Roman Catholicism, you must be willing to be accursed of God. Because you have to believe a different gospel. Matthew 15, quoted from Isaiah, teaching as precepts of God the inventions of men. Roman Catholicism, as one example, Greek Orthodox Church would be no different. It can only exist by doing something that Jesus said you will be damned to hell for. Teaching as precepts of God the inventions of men. Find me purgatory. Find me scapulas. Find me any of that stuff. Mass cards. Find me any of it. You can only be a Roman Catholic by doing something that Jesus said will condemn you to hell. Someone kneels down before a statue lights a candle or incense and prays to a dead person it is the sin of necromancy. There's one intercessor between God and man, Jesus the righteous, and he's not dead. You cannot practice Roman Catholicism without sinning. Forbidding marriage? This mandatory celibacy is a doctrine of demons, Paul says. No wonder they're pedophiles. They're demonic. I didn't say that. The New Testament does. No, I have compassion for Catholic people. But the Nicolaitans their hierarchy, their clergy who mislead them the way the rabbis mislead the Jews away from their own Messiah? That's something different. But now look at verse 22. Those who commit adultery with her. When you go down the ecumenical road, you enter into spiritual whoredom. You're getting in bed with a Christless whore. And the consequence will be pestilence. 
Oh, there is no question that there is going to be an increase in biological pestilence. It's happening. Pandemics, epidemics. But that's not the one that we should be most concerned with, even though we should be concerned. It's the ones that affect us. Pestilence. It's not just those who believe these false things, it's those who accommodate it and say it's Christian and acceptable. And now you're seeing more of them compromising on homosexuality, same-sex marriage, evangelical leaders. They're sleeping with a whore. But then it goes on. <laughs> the sword, the sword, he saw when he wrote Revelation, Jesus, and he said, the sword was coming out of his mouth. What should we do? Strengthen the things that remain, but where do we go from here? What should we do? Simple. Let the sword come out of yours. Amen. Have a wonderful evening.